Welcome to the Farcast here at Shadron State College. I'm Daniel Binkert, one of the co-hosts, and the other co-host here is Alex, as always, Alex Helmbrecht, and we're here for our inaugural Fall 2022. Did I get enough twos in there? Not Mary enough. Mary Clay Jones, Associate Professor in our English program. Yes. Great to have you here, Mary. Thank Mary you for Clay, having me. Mary Clay. Yes, Mary Clay. Yep. Thank you, Mary Clay. Um, so let's get right into it. Where did you grow up, and what schools did you attend? Oh, okay. So I was prepared for the schools. Grow up. So Have was, you grown up at all? <laughs> <laughs> still growing. <laughs> I'm still growing. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, <laughs> Drury's still out. I daydream all the time about moving to Italy and maybe starting an agro eco tourism business. I don't know. Sounds good. But hey, that's yeah, good, I mean, in theory, but. I mean, you should do it before the earth is gone. That's so. true. <laughs> We've got about <laughs> 20 years left, maybe. <laughs> Shoot. Um, so I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. And then when I was seven, I moved to Greenville, South Carolina. And that's where I grew up. And, um, okay, I went to Mitchell Road Elementary School. I'm going to name all of them. Yeah. League Middle School, Wade Hampton High School, named after a Civil War general. Yes, a Civil War general. They have not changed the name yet. Okay. And then I went to Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina for undergrad and my master's. And then I went to the University of Kentucky for my PhD. All right. All yeah. over that part of the country. <laughs> yeah, southeast. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> Definitely so all you, over the southeast. So you've lived and learned in two places that I think you can kind of tell when maybe outsiders come in. So, like, I always feel like Louisville should be like Louisville. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if people actually pronounce that. But you said, how did you pronounce your I say it. Louisville. Lou, yeah, okay. And then <laughs> yeah. what was it? Appalachian State? It's Appalachian State. And if you were south of uh, Pennsylvania, maybe, between Pennsylvania and Virginia, you say Appalachian. In the northern part of the Appalachians, they say Appalachian. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now you know. Yeah. <laughs> I would just call it App State, and then App someone State. would think I was talking about a phone. <laughs> <laughs> or a pre-meal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. App State. Yeah, for sure. It's It's got a cheesy feeling. It's very good. <laughs> yeah. It's an appetizer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I feel kind of hungry. So have you noticed any interesting dialects out here in oh, western definitely. Nebraska? Oh, definitely. Okay. Yes. Um, so I remember the first time I spoke on the phone with someone. They said, hi, hun. <laughs> oh, the hun. Yeah. Hi, yeah. hun. And I'm from the South, so I didn't mind that because it's honey pie, sweetie pie, sugar pie, lots of pies. Yeah, um, lots of pies. <laughs> lots of pie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, yeah, she said, hi, hun. And I thought, oh, that sounds very, I had seen Fargo, and I thought that sounds sort of like a Fargo accent mm -hmm. to me. It's not quite that thick. But then I have also noticed that some people say Chadron. Mm. And that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That uh, might be Chadron. Chadron. I haven't heard that one. I haven't heard that. No. Yeah. I'm going to have to listen for that one. Yeah. We have gotten a lot of people, if, if they're not familiar with the area, you know, we'll get the uh, the cold calls from salespeople perhaps. Uh, we've heard a lot of variations. Usually it, it boils down to Chadron. Yeah. Chadron. And, and, and yeah, some some people yeah. are, are, they're more teachable than others when it comes to that. <laughs> I watched a bunch of YouTube videos before my campus interview so I could hear somebody pronounce it. Oh, that's yeah. smart. Good tip. That is. That is. <laughs> Well, well, speaking of your campus interview, how'd you yes. wind up here? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, so I, I taught at Lincoln University first. That was my first tenure track job out of my PhD program. And it's a historically black college and university, so an HBCU. And the students and co my colleagues were really amazing um, but it had a history of financial negligence from the administrators. Um, they had gotten themselves in such a hole that they started firing a lot uh, or letting go. They claimed financial exigency, which is not bankruptcy, but they had to buckle down. And I thought, okay, I can't, I can't sustain mm -hmm. 
uh, teaching in a place that could go under or might fire me at any moment. So I just blanketed the country with <laughs> applications. And I sort of forgot that I had applied here. And I got that weird email from HR that says, have you been convicted of a felony? Only answer yes or no. Right. And I was like, what? Which turns out to be a good sign. It's a good it's sign. Good. It's a good sign. Yes, yes. No, I mean, I had heard nothing <laughs> at all. No follow up. And then that was the first. And I was like, where is that again? And I looked it up and I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. And I showed my husband, mm-hmm. Marcus Jones, and he said, oh, get a job there. That's cool. That looks cool. <laughs> I was like, sure, right on it. Yeah. No, and I uh, thought I bombed my phone interview, but I didn't. And they called me for a campus interview. So, yeah, I was looking for a tenure track job, which is really hard to find these days. Um, And so when I saw the area, um, I was a little shocked and a little, like, felt exposed because I'm from the southeast, so there's usually trees everywhere. We had trees at one point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I they heard all about that. <laughs> <laughs> Very sad. Yeah. Very sad. Yeah. yeah. So, but I loved it, and I thought I'd like to be here. I hope they choose me. So, and they did. Here I am. And that was what five years ago? Yeah. So I'm starting my sixth year of teaching. Wow, time, time flies. Oh my gosh, I know. Yeah. And so your your discipline is is English. Is that what you yes. studied as well? I studied all three of your degrees. I did. Yep. Okay. Well, so my undergrad was had a concentration in creative writing, so it's kind of a hard transition to academic English. Um, but I I liked it and kept going. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, that leads us into our next question, where we're going to talk about archetypes of minor characters in Tolkien's works. Oh, yeah? Oh, okay. no, no, no. That's no. Wrong. <laughs> wrong sheet. No, we needed so, to diagram a sentence back here on the, on the backdrop. I, 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 never, I never did get that part. It's kind of fun. I need to try it again. I'd have to refresh my memory on where the slots get mapped out, okay. know, depending on the length of the sentence, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> Weirdly fun. We, we produce some really weird, complicated sentences in, in this business, so that would probably be a, a good way to hear. Here's a specimen of something you'll never see anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, oh, send it to oh, Kim man. Cox or Lee Miller Yeah. for diagramming. I eat it yeah. right up. They're, they are the ones teaching the grammar and linguistics classes right now. That so. would be a good idea. Yeah, you should. <laughs> so the actual question we have then is uh, fortunately not related to diagramming sentences. <laughs> You are an avid <laughs> hiker and an amateur ornithologist, and that's good because I need some lessons on bird IDs. Okay. So where did you develop that hobby? And um, we'll come back to some more details on that. But yeah, yeah, where did that hobby come from? Well, so growing up in Greenville, <laughs> Greenville, Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> Vol? Vol, I know. Greenville. It's really hard to say vowels sometimes as a Southerner. You just, you um, just yeah, put them together. They just sort good. of like round Before, themselves yeah. out and keep going. We're sanding off the rough edges. Yeah, Here that's nice. It's, yeah. It's, uh, it's pleasant. It's fluid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Our vowels are fluid. <laughs> but sometimes I have trouble with it. Anyway, um, so I'm growing, it's at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And it's a really big county, Greenville County. And so I was about half an hour to 50 minutes away from some really great hikes. And so when I learned to drive, well, and we grew up camping up there. Um, when I learned to drive... That was the first thing I did was drive up to a state park to hike. Um, And my brother and I both really enjoyed it. But then when I went to App State, I joined the outdoor club and went on some backpacking trips and just fell in love with it. So, And actually, the whole reason why I went to App State was not because of the programs they offered, but because... Their brochure was really beautiful, and it had, like, this dancing person through the mountains. And I was like, 
I want to be oh, that dancing nice. person through the yeah, They need to get you <laughs> yeah. for a testimonial. <laughs> That's a good setup. Seriously. Yeah, for those marketing materials. So that was the, like the thematic <laughs> flow of the piece and yeah. kind of tied it all together. Yeah, so nice. that started the hiking. The birding, I started probably right after Marcus and I got married. He had a rock work business. Um, he put himself through college doing rock work. Um like uh, we, what kind of, stone what, what is, masonry. Okay. Yeah, building chimneys, retaining walls, right. pylons, but like cool. really beautiful nice. rock work. Um, so he was doing that, and I was kind of hanging out, waiting to see what I wanted to do with my future. And we lived in what we called the cliffhanger apartment, and it's off this windy, twisty road, really close to Blue Ridge Parkway land. And so I could just go across the street fight through a few rhododendron and I was in Moses Cone State Park area and so I started running back in there and hiking and meandering and I was I came home one day and said what are those tiny little easter egg looking birds and Marcus said what are you talking about I said (laughs) they're shaped like easter eggs and they're bright yellow and he was like I think they're goldfinches I said I want to see them all the time and so we went and got bird feeders and hung them off our yes. porch. And that's how it started. I got a pair of really cheap binoculars and some a guidebook. And now I probably have 25 guidebooks and four pairs of binoculars <laughs> and a really nice bird scope. It's, it's, it's not an obsession. <laughs> it's it's, not. And it's not a hobby because hobbies cost money. It's just an interest. <laughs> it's I'm totally amateur, totally amateur. But I just love the smaller the songbird, the better because I feel like it's more challenging. Yeah. So we don't have a lot of warblers who come through here because we don't have that many trees. But the ones we do, we have a few little buntings. And they're fun to watch too. So we're so tiny. excellent. <laughs> I always like watching the vultures ride the updrafts at the oh, state yeah. park. They're and really then they'll, amazing flyers. They are. And then they'll look at you from the trees and you're kind of wondering exactly why are they looking at me? <laughs> but I still like to see them. I do too. I do too. Yeah. Well, and yeah. the, on that Norweska Trail at the state park. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. there's like the trees are just yep. filled with those vultures this time of year. Yeah. I wonder, because yeah. they do seem to kind of congregate. I don't know. What is the, do you guys know what the plural noun for? Oh, yeah. Group like noun the, the for murder of ravens. Yeah. yeah. yeah murder crows. I don't know. Well, I, if I, is it awake? If I remember, it's going to flash on the screen right here. <laughs> Okay. If I remember to check and then put it on screen. Okay, cool. (laughs) Maybe a buffet of vultures. This is future Daniel checking in after the podcast. And the general term we should use for vultures is a flock, but there's also some terms we can use depending on what they're doing. When a group of vultures is flying, it's a kettle. When they're resting, it's a committee. And when they're feeding, it's a wake. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I I love the name, the group names for these different things. Some are really weird. Yeah. Um, I always thought that, like, snakes together should be a tangle, yeah. mm. a tangle of snakes. But I don't know what the group noun for that. It, may, yeah. it might be coil. They'll knot up on you. I never yeah, want to interact with that. <laughs> no, I mean, I'd watch it, but I don't want to get close. <laughs> Where are some of the spots you like to watch birds around here? Definitely the Black Hills Overlook Trail. Oh, okay. Um, it has a lot of... So I love that one because it's got several different habitats. So, you know, clear up on the, like, Buttes and Bluffs where there's a bunch of burned um, ponderosa or chard, and there's a bunch of woodpeckers up there, especially red-headed woodpeckers. Um, there's sometimes, like, little white... Throated, maybe white capped sparrows and lark sparrows up there. But then if you go down, like, you know, the back way into that trail from the rustic campground, mm-hmm. um, that's all shrubby and yeah. has some slot canyons with a bunch of trees. And so I see chickadees, nut hatches. Shadron State Park, I think, has three different kinds, the, the three North American nut hatches, which I think are the pygmy, the black capped, and the red bellied. I think is what oh, they're trust called. Trust you. I'll take your word for it. Matt Brust can 
check me on this. He can <laughs> fact check us. <laughs> I'm an amateur, Dr. Brust. <laughs> He is actually our official fact checker on the podcast. So, yeah. And, yeah. and if he makes a mistake, he emails us about it. Oh, and, that's uh, so really we're good. All right. Yeah. yeah. We'll have, All right. We'll, we'll have, have him, have him check, check it out. Check. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, some listeners may know already that you took part in most of the Ride Across America with uh, Dr. Kurt Kinbacher. And uh, we had one student, uh, Jace Demerinville, I believe it was. Demerinville. Demerinville. Yes. Sorry, Jace. Oh, hold on. Nope. I said <laughs> we, it wrong again. Oh. Demeranville. Demeranville. That's it. Demeranville. <laughs> uh, so the three of Sorry, you Jace. put a lot of miles on your bicycles for this we trip. Did. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience. Um, so Marcus Jones joined us yeah. for about a month. Um, I started the trip and did the first three weeks, dipped out for a week, and then met them in D.C. The first week was glorious. The weather was beautiful. Yeah. I felt in shape. I didn't have any chronic overuse injuries yet. Um, we had some amazing tailwinds. And so coming into Valentine, I think on our third or fourth day, I just felt like I was flying. Like we had this amazing tailwind. Um, and we got there really fast. And then the cowboy trail is really wonderful and beautiful. Um, <laughs> but then when we got to, um, Iowa, it was kind of a rough wake up call because no part of that state is flat. Whoever said it was is a big fat liar. You got you got the best parts of that state apparently. Oh. It's the Loses, so I think that's how you say it. Oh, the Less Hills. Yes. Yep. There you go. Or like, so we, the first little town we got to was named after some Dolomite or Alpinini town like Tyrol or something and. Was I can't that, remember the name, but it was like, welcome to the... Was that houses. still like, if we if we were following Highway 20 East, how far off of that um, would you have been? Well, so it was the first town in Iowa, and it was not on Highway 20 anymore. I think we would have been a little south of Highway 20. Okay. And we crossed, it was like... So we can't, we cross the river. See, I should know some of this. I'm from that part of northeast Nebraska and stuff. and okay. The Siouxland area. So I should, okay. but if it's, if it's farther south of Siouxland, then I, well, I lose track. It's, um, it would be west central Iowa. Okay. So I think, I can't remember. I have a I have a picture of it though, and it's just it's like up and down, up and down, up and down. <laughs> um, Jace and I counted. I started counting the hills per mile, and it was like seven to ten hill, hills per mile. Oh man, that was our fourth highest climbing day. Like we climbed the most feet. Yeah. The f the fourth, like you know, after all the mountain passes and. <laughs> West, it was Iowa, so that was kind of rough. And then my legs were just really tired, but it's strong. And then Indiana and um, Illinois were really flat, but wet. It rained a lot. How was the humidity? It was still May, so it wasn't terrible. Um, the humidity in DC was really bad. Mm -hmm. it was no just doubt. Oppressive. Yeah. Oppressive. I mean, it is a little swampy. Mm, sure. So. Yeah. <laughs> It was it was What insane. month would would DC have been? That was mid June. Okay. When we got on the Amtrak. Yeah, I think we just Brittany and I just missed you and Kurt yes. James by like a day or two oh, because yes. I was down there with her. Yeah. yeah. And that was the Emerging Leaders mm -hmm. Conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shonda and Dave tried to get us to stay mm -hmm. an extra day, but we we're like, We have a train to catch. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Gotta How catch was the Amtrak? Oh my gosh. Gorgeous. Beautiful. I had never done the D.C. to Chicago route, but I had done Boston to D.C. Uh, I'm sorry, Boston to Chicago and the Chicago to Denver. And I had done like Jefferson City, Missouri to Albuquerque. OK. But I'd never done. We did the Empire Builder route. And so it went through Glacier National Park. Oh, like it went yes. Way oh, north. I must have been on that. I was about 
at all. I was about like four <laughs> years old. And, and we you had remember a vacation. all of it, don't you? Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do remember my dad missed the train at one of the stops. Oh. And he, he ended up on his own little adventure getting back. <laughs> yeah, they will, they will leave you. Yep. They will leave you. Oh, man. They say, don't go too far away when you have the fresh air stop. I seem to remember that trip was up to uh, to Montana and Glacier Park. So, it was so cute. Yeah, beautiful. great part of the country. Oh, yeah, we were running kind of back and forth between several cars try- and like yeah. back and forth on the other side of the train to try to get pictures yeah. of the Did they have one of the observation mountains. cars on that? Yes, and it was packed yeah. for that. So Is that one where you have to like you know, schedule a time slot to go in there for the observation You're car? You're not supposed supposed to have to, okay. but I think what we noticed was people were out. Like, this summer yeah. was a big travel summer. I heard it's been everybody busy. was, well, everybody, I don't, I can't verify that, but <laughs> lots of people were. It turns out the whole country through <laughs> this one route. <laughs> All the campsites were pretty full. Everyone we went to, um, especially the ones that were like half RV, half tent camping, yeah. they were packed. Yeah. There were, we met a lot of other bikers along the way, too. Well, good. Um, yeah, it was really, it just opened my eyes to a whole new hobby, a whole new world of people's interests. Oh, I could see that. Yeah, we met a lot of different kinds of cyclists. Um, yeah, it was really, like, you know, sometimes it was quite miserable. <laughs> Well, of course. You're, you're riding, what, 3,500 miles? Yes. <laughs> and we, we were averaging, every time I asked Jace, because he did our route planning, and eventually he just stopped telling any of us how long the day would be because he was probably tired of us asking questions. <laughs> but I'd say, Jace, how many miles do we have today? Jace, how many miles do we have today? And I always ended up being 70. I just feel like. Even though we said we were going to average 60 miles a day, some days we had to, you know, take rest days. Sometimes people were hurt or sick, and we had to have a rest day. But um, it was rarely just 60. It's like yeah. almost always 70 miles. Making progress. Yeah. So it, it was definitely a group thing then. Like if one of you was feeling off, then it was oh, the, the yeah. whole group. You know, yeah. Hanging out. Everybody would. Yeah, we would accommodate each other Great. the best that we could. Nice. Yeah. No, and I still love everyone. I still. <laughs> hey, that's the big one. Come the other side is. of that. That's a plus. You know, living out of tents in close proximity 24-7 um, with. So I was there for seven weeks. It was a total of 71 days, I think. Um, yeah. So. I wasn't sure Kurt Kimbacher would still like me, but I think he does. We went on a ride a couple of weeks ago. So. Nice. <laughs> That's good. I'm We're glad you didn't pass yeah. the test. <laughs> yeah. So uh, kind of switching the gears, um, although I suppose that was an academic pursuit for Jace. One it of your, was. One of your <laughs> academic pursuits and one of your academic uh, interests is mm-hmm. uh Women in movement yes. within mid to late 19th century. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. Well, so at first, so we lived in Charleston, South. I mean, uh, this is a long kind of evolving story that is more about my research and about a lot of my interests together. Um, we, Marcus and a friend of his from college, started basically a DoorDash in Charleston, South Carolina. Before that was a thing. Um, And when I got into my PhD, um, we we had both been driving. Oh, he probably drove sometimes 200 miles a day because it was a delivery service. But and I was commuting between three different colleges and adjuncting five classes at three different colleges. It was yeah, it was hustling. And the commutes across so many interstates, highways, intercoastal waterways, just made my soul black. And I felt I was very unhappy. So when I got into grad school, I said, I don't want to drive to work ever again. And so we, like, drew a radius, a three-mile radius around the University of Kentucky and decided we'd live inside that radius. Um, So that's when I started thinking about women's bodies moving through space. And so my dissertation and my current book project 
and a lot of my research interests have to do with women's bodies in public space. And the hypothesis is that it's always subversive, even now in the 21st century. Um, and so during the Victorian era, especially middle-class women were very policed and even mistaken for prostitutes if they were out on a city street without a chaperone. It didn't matter what they were wearing or even if they were carrying a Bible. If they were a woman without protection, they would probably get unwanted attention. Mm. Hmm. Um, and people try to control women's bodies in space all the time, but at that era when they had this ideological, I mean, Victorian society itself sort of made this term separate spheres where men left the home to go to work and participated in the outside world, the world of the public, business, government. Women were in charge of the domestic sphere, raising children, managing households. Um, so things got sticky and complicated when women started leaving that domestic sphere for different reasons. There are whole lots of fascinating studies about different ways that women get to leave the sphere, like for philanthropy, church missions, suffrage, well, abolition, you know, political movements. Um, but middle class women who want to travel on their own or who kind of have the moxie to, to go to um, strangers' houses or in men's offices without knowing those people or having proper introductions in place, that's kind of ballsy. And so I'm looking at when that happens in novels um, and what allows them that access and why they aren't punished and made examples of in Victorian society. So I'm looking at women who fly under the radar a little bit. And my argument is that they're using material culture. So they're, they're taking really common feminine objects of material culture, like jewelry, cosmetics, clothing, and shielding themselves and their intentions. It looks like they're being hyper feminine, but they're using it in a subversive way to kind of access spaces they're not normally allowed in. Hmm. Yeah. So that's what I'm working on right now. Okay. Yes. Right. And, and you said that it's a potential book project? It, so I sent the book proposal off about a year and a half ago, um, which is a, oh, everything in academia moves really slow. And, you know, we teach a lot mm -hmm. at this college, so it's hard to get research done during the school year. Right. Um and it received a revise and resubmit. Oh, so that's good. Nice. Yeah, that's promising. Yeah. So I'm working on the revisions right now. Okay. Yeah, go up for tenure in January. So um, I'm going to try to have that sent off before my tenure yeah. portfolio is submitted. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, is there is there like one piece of, of evidence or maybe there is like a text or a manuscript that you keep coming back to that is maybe more than the others in your in your research or are you finding lots of different pieces throughout oh so many different examples okay of this at work um it starts to happen one of my uh, peer reviewers said why do you have so many texts from 1870 and i didn't even notice that i had and i thought i need to figure out why well the women's property act of 1872 allows women to keep some of their property uh, after marriage so that it's not all, it doesn't all belong to their husband. Um, and this kind of injects Victorian society with a new awareness. Oh, women are not happy with the laws of this country. Mm -hmm. Women are trying to get outside the house and do other things. Um, and the women, the woman writer becomes kind of a, a profession in the 1880s, late 1870s, 1880s. And so a lot of the, that's why I'm so interested in that era because there's a flourishing of women going into public space and professions. And I'm wondering how, how do they get to do that? Mm. What enables them to do that so nice yeah. yeah 
Well, so you are involved with uh, student advocacy, and let's see, you helped sponsor a Take Back the Night Walk last spring. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and uh, what's in store for this year? Oh, great question. Well, this is, can I selfishly plug? Yeah, sure. I have, so thank you, shout out to one of our alumna, um, Jory Peters, who's yeah. now in law school at UNL. She got this, in, this initiative started last March, um, and she kind of passed the baton to two of her fellow Cardinal Key members, and they reached out to me and said, can we start planning? And so I contacted Dr. Powell, and um, we have, they are just on it. They are organized, <laughs> maybe more organized than I am. So we have decided to do a Take Back the Night walk in the fall, and okay. it's going to be October 27th at 5 or 5.30. I think it's 5.30. Um, and we'll meet at the stadium again, and it'll probably be dark by the time we start walking, and that yeah. way people can, you know, we want to light up the night with our phones and things like that. Mm -hmm. Very good. And make everybody feel safe. So, and I mean, I guess my advocacy comes from... Well, being a woman in space is hard, and so my I am a sexual assault survivor, and I don't want that to happen to our students, and I want to raise awareness about it, but also support survivors. Um, and that has everything to do with, you know, catcalling, attempts to control a woman's body in space, or against her will, like those are all related power yeah. moves mm -hmm. um, and signs of a patri patriarchal culture. And so, yeah, I'd like to, I like to advocate for my, and our allies, you know, our male allies across campus. We had a lot of men from the faculty and staff side who came to support us last April. So that was Good. really awesome. I'd like for more students to get involved. Um, so we, we do have that. And then I think in the spring we'll have a, um, brunch with Title IX and cover the cruiser during spring days. That was really successful last time. And then we might have a coffee chat in November, but that's, we're still working on the details with that. All right. Good. Yeah. Well, more to come then. More to come. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's, it's great work and it's, um, certainly appreciated by a lot on campus. Oh, so thanks. thanks. So. Kind of talking about teaching, your profession. What are yes. some of the classes that you teach? And oh what, what would you say your teaching philosophy is? Oh, gosh. Okay. That's that's a bag of worms. Okay. Um, just because there's a... Well, okay. I don't know if I can narrow down my teaching philosophy. I'll you try to. You don't have to. It's one of those standard <laughs> questions. <laughs> my teaching philosophy. At this stage in the interview. Uh. Uh, well, so we here at Shattern State... Um, college teach a lot. And I mean, probably, I don't know if we teach as much as a smaller department, like history <laughs> and, and political science, they might teach a wider range of classes than we do. Um, and they have fewer people, but sometimes I feel a little bit like Gumby, which is really fun, but sometimes a little bit overwhelming. So I teach multi-ethnic literature, Native American literature, gender and sexuality literature. Sometimes I teach um, literary theory um, and criticism, which I loved, 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 loved teaching that. That was a lot more fun than I thought it would be. Yeah, that's when you get the deep thinking going. Yeah, and so you could just watch students' minds. They're like, wait, what? Oh, my <laughs> God, that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, think about institutional operations and their designs on you in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I wish things were that draconian sometimes. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> it would imply that there was more planning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that somebody had an idea of yeah. what was really going on. Right, right. Um, maybe that's a darker skepticism that isn't, is less present that's a lot of the French theorists. But yeah, no, you're right. I can remember taking a language theory uh, class, and when you study the death of the author, 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's very interesting. And, you know, when you're coming from, yeah. you know, school or community college or, or whatever, like you don't necessarily go that in depth into the literary uh, theory or, or what's behind stuff. And right. so when you kind of see how the, the, the cheese is made, so to speak, yes. it's, it's very cool. It is. It's fun. It also hurts your brain a little bit. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell my students. You can't think too much. Like 20 pages of theory takes me about an hour to really read. Whereas if I'm reading, you know, a murder mystery novel that's sure. like cotton candy, you know, you read, I don't know how many pages in an hour. Well, you're not, yeah, you're not checking footnotes. And no, and you're not like, just wait, what does that, that word yeah. mean? Yeah, where the footnotes are longer than the sentence. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or they take up more of the page yeah. than the actual writing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right now I'm teaching major writers. Um and gosh, I've taught grammar and linguistics, lots of composition classes. Yeah, so I've had the opportunity. Kim Cox and I swapped, and she let me teach a Britlet A class, and that was really fun. Beowulf to Jonathan Swift, oh, that was yeah. really, really fun. So, yeah, but my teaching philosophy, okay, so I'll use some. Um, official pedagogical terms. I think it's called a flipped classroom model where you encourage students to do a lot of the talking and you promote inquiry so that they become the authors of their own knowledge rather than looking to me as like the ultimate authority on the knowledge to be disseminated. And so I really do begin most of my classes with some kind of free writing to gauge what they're thinking about, um, what they picked up from a text or reading, or what they understand an assignment to be. And then I go from there. I usually always have a plan. It's not very detailed every day anymore. Um, I think this is my 18th year of teaching, if you include. Mm -hmm teaching undergrad. Um, I'm sorry, teaching in my master's and my PhD program, two undergrads. Um, So I like to get them talking, basically, and I like to see what each person was sort of thinking about as they were reading, and then I try to construct a narrative and, and get them to think about how all their ideas could be connected and why. Um, We also talk about a lot of historical references. I love to dig into the historical references in any text so that they have a larger context at work because nothing is created in a vacuum, despite what the new critics Hmm. thought. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that the text is itself all we need. I can't remember who who said that. Anyway. I'd have to ask somebody who's a modernist either. Yeah, I don't know. Not us. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know if we have a legit modernist. I'll talk to Kim. She'd know. She, she'll know. <laughs> we'll have to have some follow-up podcasts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're going to revisit all New this. New critical theory. <laughs> So we, we do have a, a few more questions, but we, okay. I, I'm looking at my watch and going, we're going to have to skip ahead a little. We're okay. Get to the, I'm sorry. I'm chatty. No, it's fine. It's <laughs> fine. I, I wish we had more time. But we're going to get the, uh, the quick hitting questions. And okay. these are some of the most deep and um, really difficult to answer questions. Okay. So kind of first thing that comes to your mind. Oh, uh, we're playing associative. Like first thing that comes to your mind when I say. Um. A group of vultures. Yeah. Awake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is this one's a little easier. Okay. <laughs> what is one of your favorite movies? Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, that's hard. Um, Not the absolute, of course. Just okay, right. On, on the list, because that just can't. Yeah. yeah. I love Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I still need to see that. Oh, yeah. oh that's my a great choice. It's that's such a, great a good movie. Yeah. It's yeah. Very bittersweet, though. So bittersweet. I usually like things that are happy, sad. Yeah. <laughs> bittersweet. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of sad, sad. Capital S, sad, maybe lowercase happy. There we yeah. Go. <laughs> yeah. If, if there are such things. I know. Okay. Uh, um, 
And then The Usual Suspects is a really good one. I kind of, I like action thrillers, but I also like drama. I like comedies too, but comedies are really hard. Yeah. Comedies in short bits are better, I feel like, like a TV show, rather than a whole movie, because sometimes it's hard to sustain, you know. The, yeah, it feels like there's so often that, whether it's two-thirds in or whenever it is, but yeah. Yeah. Maybe this needed some uh, edit, some tightening up in editing yeah. just to move it along. And I have trouble with slapstick. So Dumb and Dumber, it's <laughs> mm, just okay for me. <laughs> but The Wedding Singer, Adam Sandler, some yeah. of his stuff is great. I don't like the earlier stuff, but I liked that one. Yeah, yeah. Maybe because you're a, a Billy Idol fan. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I am a Billy Idol fan. Who isn't? Sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> what's, a, what's a hidden talent of yours? Ooh, hidden talent. Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> nur, nur ein bisschen. <laughs> I bet Marcus is just cringing. He's going to cringe when he hears this. Yeah, I learned German a little bit. I'm conversational. I am not fluent. Um, to talk with his family. Um, mm-hmm. And I worked at it, but I also think maybe I have a good ear. Yeah, I really enjoy languages. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. I don't know if it's a talent, but... It's something about, yeah, it, it just if I could, would call it the shape of those words. Mm. Th- there's just something about it. Yeah. Or at least, so my, my thing is the uh, the Ninth Symphony, Beethoven, that, mm. that, that chorus at the end, the, all that German and how it gets layered. So even if you have the words in front of you, you're trying to match it up and it's no, it's not just one singer at one point. It's four different singers or four different groups that singing. Layering. Yeah. And it just, <laughs> but it's beautiful in its own way. It is beautiful. I, so I watched Lord of the Rings actually. The Did you watch the German dub? I watched it in German. Yeah. Oh, man. And I was like, I think this is the language it's meant to be spoken in. It felt right. Mm, nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was Good. I mean, I had, of course, seen the English one first. But. Yeah, you know the flow of it. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I need to try that. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. What's the best advice that you ever received as a college student? Ooh, as a college student. <sighs> hmm. Hmm. Or to flip it, what's the best advice you've given Give college, college students? Student. <laughs> well, so this is something oh. I did not do. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> but... I go talk to your professors. I would really recommend go meet them and get a baseline so that you know when you get in the lurch or in the weeds, kind of feeling overwhelmed, it's not going to be everything at once. Mm-hmm. Like we're meeting for the first time, yeah, one on one, and also I'm in crisis. It's kind of easier to deal with some crises if you have established a rapport with somebody and all the professors here I well I can't speak for everyone but I, most of the faculty I've met here are really approachable yeah and care about their students um, so I'd say go talk to your professors yeah that's good that advice. would be the best advice I think I could give absolutely aside from do your reading <sighs> I'm not kidding when I say, for next class, please read pages 53 to 103. It's not a joke. It's not a recommendation. Mm-hmm. Do your reading. <laughs> People aren't reading as much these days. <laughs> Definitely more of that. So maybe two things. Yeah. Visit your professors and do your reading. It's good for you. It's good for you. What word comes to your mind when you think of Shadron State College? Hmm. Fam Damley. Fam Damley. Fam. We've not had that one. <laughs> Did I hear that right? Fam Damley? What mm-hmm. does that mean? The whole Fam Damley. Uh-huh. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a, you know, sometimes a mixed bag. Yeah. But it's small enough to sort of feel like we're one happy, dysfunctional family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can be. We're not always dysfunctional. <laughs> this makes me uh, think of. I w- watched a recent episode of Rick and Morty at lunch, and 
<laughs> they, it was about Thanksgiving, and they said that thanks. Think of your life as a subscription, and Thanksgiving is the date where you pay your dues. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's brilliant! <laughs> so maybe that's brilliant. that kind of lines up with what <laughs> yeah. you're saying. Maybe so. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yes. No. No. I. Um, I think this is a really excellent place for the region, but it's also just a really special little place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have um, really enjoyed being here. I've especially enjoyed my students and colleagues and the landscape. I mean, yeah, you can walk five minutes from your house and get on the Sea Hill Trails. Um, you can hop on your bike and be at the state park and, you know, Tough to be. Five minutes, yeah, on a bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have such great natural beauty around here. Yeah, um, it's a strange and wonderful place. Yes, it is. Just like life. Just like yeah. life. <laughs> that strange journey. Yep. <laughs> Well, thank you for, I was trying to think of a way to like, thank you for joining us on this strange journey. One, one small step <laughs> the in the strange cast. journey on the Farcast. Yeah, good to have you on the show, Mary Clay. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. Yeah, thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you guys.